When we read James, we, we see how very practical he is, and in some ways, the book of James really sounds like the Sermon on the Mount, a lot of the same topics, and told and spoken, taught in, in a very similar style. And of course, we think this James is actually Jesus's half-brother. Um, this is his, uh, or his stepbrother. So James has that flavor of the Jewish teacher, um, very much like Jesus. And as we look at this passage in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, yeah, it's talking about being impartial. It's talking about favoritism. Another word for that is prejudice, right? That's another word. Th this is a passage about being prejudiced. And the root of the word prejudice, you can hear it there, it's to judge. Prejudice means to prejudge, to prejudge a situation. And of course, what we understand is it's making a judgment before you really know all the facts based on something very, very superficial, like in the illustration that uh, James is using, the, the circumstance evidently that was going on with the Christians the, the very thing he's addressing, it's making judgment based on a person's attire and how much money they obviously have and then judging something about them and a poor person likewise. One very kind of positively in showing favoritism, the other one negatively in thinking, well, this person doesn't offer much because this person's poor. So that's what James is talking about we could talk about it as prejudice, showing favoritism or partiality. And the subject of that he's discussing isn't limited to the idea of being prejudiced about ter in terms of class, in terms of wealth and social status. Although that's specifically what he's discussing, the principle applies in so many other areas of life, and all of us can be familiar that that it is easy to fall into prejudging, to making uh, decisions about the relative, perhaps, value or importance of other people based on a lot of different criteria. I mean, we hear it about um, age. You know, sometimes because in our culture we value productivity, that as people get older and they're less productive, and we don't really value wisdom and experience, <laughs> we start thinking they offer less because they can't work hard and be as productive because generally we don't value as much wisdom. And so there's a kind of bias maybe against older people. There can be a bias against younger people. There can be the bias, well, you're still in your 20s. You don't know anything yet. St. Athanasius wrote on the incarnation when he was about 28, that is an incredible treatise on the importance and the understanding of Jesus taking on human flesh and becoming the one who redeems us all. He wrote that in his 20s. The next time you're tempted to think, well, the person's young, they don't know anything yet. Mm, you, not, a, not a good judgment to make. You never know who might have great wisdom. We see it all the time with regards to gender. Right? People make kind of rash assessments. Well, you know, men are uh, whatever, smarter. Elon Musk recently liked a, a, a suggestion that the, the country ought to be run by alpha males. I guess women don't count, and if you aren't an alpha male, you don't have an open mind and you can't effectively run things. Um, I would say that's a prejudiced opinion, right? But we hear it in, in the reverse. I mean, we can hear uh, things about that men can't be nurturing or, or men can only be kind of boorish and crude. And that's not true either, right? We hear about it in terms of education, right? How many degrees does the person have? What level of education have they completed in their life? those sorts of things. And there's numerous, we could go on and on and mention all the ways in which we 
can tend to size up each other, categorize each other, and then make these prejudgments. And James, in his very blunt style, says down in verse 9, this is sin. He says to show partiality is sin. He's not making any bones about it. He's not kind of, well, it's not the wisest thing. to you know, He says it's just wrong, right? It's just wrong. It's against the ways of God to show partiality or favoritism, to, to be prejudiced against people based on their ethnicity or education or age or any other criteria. And I want us to see how he works this out because the issue here for James is, is not really the favoritism. It's about love. Do you notice in verse 8? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. So as he, discuss, as he discusses favoritism, partiality, prejudice, he says it's a failure to love your neighbor well. I mean, let's just get down to the crux of it. He says you're not loving others well when you show favoritism, when you have partiality in how you treat others, or you have prejudice, opinions, and thoughts. You're just not loving well. You're not keeping the, what he calls the royal command to love one another. And so in that sense, we've got to read this passage in James, James 2, 1 through 10, as really about love, discussed in the context of favoritism and how that can play out and the problems that that can bring. And I want us to explore a little bit more as he delves into the specifics of the situation obviously going on with the Christians with whom he has some uh, understanding about how they're behaving. So he gives his example in verse 2, For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and you say, sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves? That's the first point. You've made distinctions and become judges with evil motives. So there's a couple things going on. He says you're making distinctions based on these very super, superficial aspects of our life here on this earth, right? how much one possesses, how much wealth one has. He says, that's how you're making distinctions. You're making this division in your ways of looking at people. You're dividing them into the rich and the poor. You're making these distinctions. And you've become judges. That's the prejudice idea. You're prejudging. And he says, with evil motives. So what are the evil motives? He doesn't. He doesn't, you know, express that, illuminate what it is. But I suspect, just thinking about the situation, the evil motives probably have more to do with that I might gain something from the rich person who could benefit me, but the poor person probably isn't going to be able to help me in any way. It seems to me that probably what's going on, giving deference and special attention to the rich person in, their, in this context, is because that person might actually help me in some sort of way. So when he starts to critique what they're doing and says it's really about love, it's not that they're loving the rich person. They're not loving them by treating them as they are. I think they're, they're treating them as they are for the possibility of gaining a personal advantage. It's really out of selfish motives that they say to the rich person, oh, sit in an important seat, you know, this person might help me, right? That's what they're thinking. Those are the perhaps the evil motives. It's really a selfish agenda. So they aren't loving the rich person well, and they aren't, even, and they aren't loving the poor person well. They're, lo they're loving no one is what 
James seems to be saying, and he's trying to wake them up to this, right? You've gone about this in a way in which you've made judgments, you've made distinctions, and the motives of your heart are not what they should be. Then verse 5, listen, my beloved brethren. Hear the phrase, my beloved brethren. Although he's, although he's talking about some obvious faults in how they're behaving towards one another, he calls them, but you're my beloved brothers and sisters, right? We're, we're in this together bound by love, and James is expressing that as he encourages them to, to have and express greater love for one another, he himself is expressing this. And I think that in some ways takes the edge off the bluntness, right? You are my beloved brethren, but I'm trying to urge you to act differently, to treat one another differently. But where he starts, as he's, he says, now listen, think about it. What does he start with? This is a good theological pattern to follow. He starts with, how does God act? If you want to approach things in a good theological manner, in other words, thinking about the things of God in a good orderly manner, start with, how does God do things? Then derive from that, therefore, how should I do things? And what does he say? Right? Because this is what he does, this is what Paul does, this is what Jesus does. All of our teachers in the faith, apostles in Christ himself, are always reasoning from the standpoint of what is my father doing, Jesus says. Do likewise. Same for Paul and same here for James. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Now, I don't think what he means is, and God is showing favoritism by doing this for the poor and not for the rich. No, that would not be what he's saying. His point is, while you give little credence or value or esteem for the poor, look, God has chosen them to lavish on them riches of faith. So while your eyes are only seeing the earthly riches you're not seeing the spiritual eyes and seeing, but this person has spiritual riches, perhaps riches of understanding, riches of good works, riches in terms of fruit of the spirit within their own being, within their own self. And if God has lavished upon this person, though poor in the world, such riches, how can you be making these distinctions and saying this person is not important, this person is not rich? because they don't own material goods. See, that's the way he's reasoning. He's not saying God has only blessed the, the poor with these spiritual things. I think he's trying to show where God has lavished kindness upon those poor in this world, giving us the example that we should not discount or ignore their station in life based upon more worldly aspects. So he says they are heirs of the kingdom. This is what God has done for them. And he goes on then to say, and this is because he's talking about, as I said, the, the treatment of the poor, but you have dishonored the poor person. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Now, this part sounds to me very much like parts of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus, in very practical terms, says there are certain people who are the ones who mistreat you. When Jesus says, you know, turn the other cheek, he's often, he's referring to a kind of situation where often the person who is insulting them, because the, the, the slap on the cheek is a backhanded slap, that insult is often given by a person of greater power and means in the world. When Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, don't resist the evil person. When Jesus talks about, you know, when if someone sues you to take your coat, give him your cloak as well. 
for those common people that he was speaking to on that hillside, peasants, the people who were often doing th that to them were the people of greater means. I mean, it was a reality of their economic situation. It's different today. It really is. I mean, the way our world works, a, a person can have greater wealth in our day and time, and it's not the dynamic that it was in the ancient world. So we can't read these passages and say, you know, well, what's the, the threshold of, of net worth that then determines you've become one of those rich people who's now, who's now unspiritual and not close to God, you know. That's not what James is saying. But their world was different. Most people, if you were a baker, you could never become rich. There was no way to create a, a brand of bakeries and, you know, franchise and, and become rich through baking bread. If you bake bread, you just always made enough to live on, right? The only way to get rich in the ancient world was you had to acquire lands and you had to acquire servants and you had to acquire, I mean, it was a different kind of process where today you could write a great American novel. It could make the bestseller list and you end up rich and you've oppressed nobody. You just wrote a good story that other people like to read, right? So he's talking about a different world. And he's talking truthfully for their world that they often as commoners, when they got sued, it wasn't their fellow commoner who did that. It was someone of greater means. And so James is saying, you're showing deference to people, but these are not often the people who actually share your love and your faith and your way of life. And in fact, they're mistreating you He's not recommending that they mistreat them in turn, but he is trying to get them to think about why it is they show special favoritism to these individuals. But the end of what he concludes is what we saw in verse 8. If we fulfill the royal law, which is, according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, now you're doing well, right? That's what we aspire to do. And you've got to think back to when Jesus was asked, well, who's my neighbor? And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And he, you know, at the end of that story, he doesn't say, he really doesn't answer the question, who is my neighbor? He, sa he, he asked, who was neighbor? to the man who was beaten up on the side of the road. Neighbor then becomes not what they are to me, but whether I am going to be that to them. Who was neighbor? Who acted neighborly? And the answer is, well, the Samaritan did. So when he got asked, who's my neighbor? He basically flips it around and says, who are you going to be neighbor to? So James brings up the same thing. It's about loving one another, and it's about whether we are going to be neighborly, as it were, loving those because of who we are, those that we encounter in life. Not because who they are to us, but because of who we are to them. And who we are to them doesn't matter who they are. It's about who I am going to be. Am I going to be the kind of person who then loves Whoever is in front of me, does it matter their age? Does it matter their ethnic background? Does it matter whether English is their first language or a second or third language? You know, sometimes, well, they're not very, uh, doesn't know English very well, but he knows seven languages, right? All of us who are monolingual are like, yeah, they don't know English well. Yeah. No, they don't know English well. They can speak three other languages, though, fluently, and they're pretty passable in English as well. You know, so easy to make these kinds of judgments, right? So James says it's on us to love because God loves, because God honors people for their who they are in their spirit. Verse 9, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and have 
and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. Again, I hear the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus saying, you've heard that it was said, don't do this. But I'm telling you, let's just ask, have you done something like even in your heart, right? You've become a lawbreaker. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount t- telling people that if they had confidence that they had not crossed a certain boundary and not done a certain thing, he backs it up and says, but have you been angry in your heart? Have you left it in your heart? Have you made, you know, rash oaths? What have you done? It's like James is saying, I can't stand on my own righteousness, on my own uprightness. If I've made any error, then I too am a lawbreaker. I'm a sinner. So the person before me is a sinner as well. And we stand on level ground. I'm no higher up than them. They're no lower down than me. Right? We stand on level ground before each other. Maybe what James knew about the people he was writing to is there was a, there was a sense of superiority about their own spirituality. And he's skewering that as well. If you've made any sort of error, well, then you've broken it, the law, as it were. So now you posture yourself in a more humble position, knowing you too need grace, extending grace to the person before you. I think the ways to think about this for ourselves are pretty obvious. I really enjoyed John David's children's time because I think each one of us can recall times in which we were disregarded, right? Counted as less. Somehow we're on the the negative end of prejudice, of favoritism. And the reason you can still remember those times is like his little illustration. It left a crease in the paper, didn't it? Right? I can recall those times when I got left out John David did a great job because he told stories on himself as not when he got hurt, but when he was the perpetrator. That was, that's a good way to do it, right? Not to call out the sins of others, but to name your own. So the, the thing we are to take away is pretty obvious. And I like what John David was saying. Let us do less injury that God then has to in his grace heal. May I not be giving God more work to do, more people to heal because I'm going around causing that injury. And when I fail to do that as well as I should, as I fail to love my neighbor as myself, then let me appeal to God to teach me. May we learn from James a better way to love.